Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Oxford Internet Institute's live UK book launch for Professor Philip Howard's Lie Machines, featuring Dr. Vijay Narayanan. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinion of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. There will be time for an audience Q&A session at the end, so please do, please do pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time and keep questions as concise as possible. Questions can also be upvoted. These will be visible to all attendees and we will endeavour to follow up any unanswered qu queries. Please allow me to introduce Phil and Vidya. Hello everybody, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the book launch of Lime Machines by Professor Phil Howard. Uh, Phil Howard is a professor and a writer. He's the director of the Oxford Internet Institute at Oxford University. He investigates the impact of digital media and political life around the world, and he's a frequent commentator on global media and political affairs. His research has de demonstrated how new information technologies are used in both civic engagement and social control in countries around the world. He's the author of several books, including The Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, Pax Technica, and most recently of Lie Machines, How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Robots, sorry, Junk News Operations and Political Operatives, published by the Yale University Press. With that, I would like to hand over to Phil and invite him to introduce Lie Machines and share key highlights from the book. Over to you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, for those kind words. Um, and thank you for agreeing to host today. Um, Dr. Narayanan and I have done many different kinds of projects over the last few years. And so I think um, I'll speak for some 20 minutes or so about the contents of the book, Lie Machines. But then we'll have a, a 10 minute conversation or so about the different things that I know we're both interested in, and I'm looking forward to that, that conversation. I think one of the challenging, one of the challenging aspects uh, of doing this work is that the, the, the challenge, the problem of lie machines, the problem of big political lies seems to get uh, worse and worse. Uh, the book itself is about uh, the 2016 election, the 2018 election, Russian interference, uh, it's about uh, the Brexit debate in this country. Um, but as we go through some of the stories, as I tell some of the stories where the book came from and what it's about, um, I want to land at a point where we can talk about what's happening now. And of course, the US 2020 election is on the horizon. Uh, an important election in Singapore has been declared for about a month from now. Uh, Ghana votes in, a significant, votes, uh, in the national elections at the end of the year. So most of this storyline is about what happens at elections. We should also be ready to talk about misinformation on COVID. I'm gonna share my screen uh, to offer a little presentation uh, on how the book emerged and what its main themes are and give a little background uh, onto what the OII, the Oxford Internet Institute itself does. Let me load this up. I'd say the book is a result of uh, four years of work and uh, studies across many different kinds of countries. Um, I wanna offer a discount code uh, for those of you who I hope will still be interested in this topic uh, at the end of the hour. The book is Lie Machines and uh, the discount code YLIES can be used only from the publisher's website, uh, Yale University Press in the US or the Yale Press site in the UK. Um, but please, if you're still interested in this topic at the end of, at the end of our hour and interested in the book, um, do, try the, do try the discount code and, um, as you order a book. So the agenda for my uh, short 20 minutes or so is to talk about the research team, uh, define lie machines, and go into the latest evidence about what, they're, what they do, where they come from, and how, what kind of impact they have. I want to talk a little bit about what's changed since the book uh, was written and then talk about some of the strategies for dealing with all this stuff because ultimately I think our goal is to try to uh, break lie machines and prevent them from being built, prevent them from ruining public life. The group I work with is uh, between 10 and 12 people, graduate students, postdocs, other researchers, faculty, 
Uh, and our mission, a particular mission of our group, is to try to improve civic engagement using information technologies to raise our engagement with public problems, uh, to try to improve public discourse, answer the world's grand challenges. The o Oxford Internet itself, Internet Institute itself, is a department of about 30 faculty. Um, several of our colleagues are here. Uh, several of them are computer scientists. Another batch are social scientists. Another batch are humanists. And the reason this is important is that it often takes our humanists to answer, to ask big theory questions and the social scientists to try to figure out what evidence would look like to answer those questions and the computer scientists help us build. So this, this interactive environment between different disciplines in a university setting is actually pretty rare and it's pretty valuable. The team I work with uh, is, has expertise in many different kinds of countries and many different kinds of data sciences. As I said, we're between 8 and 12, depending on where, where people are on the program. Um, and the current group has been very important, both to identifying new research questions and to answering those research questions. The bulk of what I'm going to talk about today was funded by the National Science Foundation in the US and the European Research Council uh, in uh, the EU. The public engagement work, much of the public engagement work we do is supported by the Omidion Network as well. Let me say a little bit about the kinds of um, things that I study and what the unit of analysis is in this book. Uh, I define a lie machine as a social and technical mechanism for putting a mistruth, an untrue claim into the service of some political ideology. Now, the important part of this definition, uh, the two important parts, are the social and the technical side of things. The technical side, for the most part, refers to the social media algorithms that deliver content to you when you go searching for news, political news and information. The social side of it is the organization of people, or resources, um, political parties, lobbyists, who produce the lies. And I think it doesn't make sense to analyze modern politics without giving some role to the technical system, the social media platforms, and the organizational behavior. If, if you just tell the story of political figures uh, who are um, immoral and lying about public life, that's incomplete. If you just try to blame Facebook or Twitter or one of the social media platforms, that's incomplete too. You need both sides of the story to really understand what's going on. Now, when we gather evidence, we draw on many kinds of platforms to tell a story about the production system, where, where lies come from, uh, the distribution system, how those lies get delivered to your social media feeds, to your inboxes, uh, and then the marketing, the sort of aftermarketing that occurs when fake news operations take a story, take a conspiracy, and spin it out. Now, when we play with data about this stuff, we often take a big scoop of uh, Twitter data or Facebook data. One of the latest conspiracies that we're all working on um, has to do with COVID, misinformation around COVID. And it's unfortunate, but it's also uh, fascinatingly complex, the misinformation around COVID. It links a personality like Mr. Gates with a long time myth about the, uh, from the anti-vax movement that uh, vaccinations are a, a conspiracy program to, uh, to infect us with new diseases or cause more, so, more social problems. So there's an anti-vax aspect, there's a Bill Gates aspect, there's a 5G aspect, um, perhaps COVID came from the 5G towers that are springing up. All of this is misinformation, but it's connected in one very long and complex storyline that has existed before COVID um, and is embedded in one particular public figure uh, and is about a conspiracy that uh, doesn't exist, but is uh, very easy to promulgate online. It's very easy to excite people and ask questions. You know, what would happen uh, if there's a cure found and if uh, the state wanted to inject us all with RFID chips? But this is not happening, but it's a great example of the complexity of a political lie these days. Often when we start a fresh scoop of Twitter data, we start with accounts that show clear signs of um, having been part of a foreign actor's misinformation campaign. Uh, the bear might give it away on this one. This is an account from 2016 that we tracked, uh, one that would work in English, but then occasionally uh, slip into Cyrillic and start talking politics in a way that would not be natural for uh, the average social media user. 
Um, when we start with a fresh scoop of accounts, when we look for bots, uh, we sometimes start with Trump's follower list. And I don't mean that as a political dig. I mean it simply that he's got a large number of fake accounts, uh, no pictures, numbers instead of names, no real content. And the problem for public life is when these accounts wake up and spread some piece of misinformation about COVID, about um, women in hijab storming the beach on your fame and during your vacation or storming the passport control uh, office in Morocco, events that didn't happen, uh, photos that have been doctored, and stories that are promoted from a news agency that's not very trustworthy. At this point, we've studied these kinds of problems, these kinds of stories, uh, these kinds of um, myths uh, across many different countries, and many different types of regimes. And the trick to doing this kind of work well is to be multi-method, right? We want some good stories that involve qualitative fieldwork. We need stories from the bot writers and troll farms, the, the organizations that produce this stuff. Uh, we need to be able to understand the computational side of things. It's something that our, our colleague Vidya is particularly good at. Um, understanding the algorithmic decision, how algorithms assign content to different baskets and distribute it. Uh, return search when you look, when you search on YouTube. All that computational side of things must be complemented with the qualitative and the comparative data in order for us to make sense and interpret it. Now I want to do a quick walkthrough of some of the data that we work with in um, with, with the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence in the United States. As um, some of you may know, uh, the social media firms turned over a significant amount of data to the US Senate at a time in over 2017 and 2018 um, when there were multiple inquiries into election interference. The chart I've showed here tracks the traffic from known Russian fake accounts, accounts that were clearly managed from St. Petersburg, according to Facebook. So this isn't my attribution, it's, it's the company's attribution. These are accounts clearly managed from Facebook, from, um, Facebook accounts clearly managed from St. Petersburg. And it's a simple uh, line graph of the traffic, the output of these accounts. And there's a couple of lessons we can draw from this fairly straightforward map over time. The first is that spikes in traffic rise during the natural rhythm of the electoral calendar. When there's a big debate, the Russian accounts wake up and are active. When there's a national convention, uh, or a particularly hot story, or on voting day, there's a spike of Russian activity. But the interesting fig thing about this figure for me is not only that the rhythm of Russian interference maps onto the natural events in political life, but that the bulk of activity here is after 2016. If you look at the figure, the data was handed over to the Senate in the summer of 2018. Uh, if you look at the figure, it's almost as if the Russian account slowed down a little bit um, maybe they, uh, the managers decided they were having an impact and then they made a serious investment and put more money and time. The bulk of this activity is actually from 2017 and 2018. So the story didn't end with 2016, it's definitely continued. In this graph, I've chosen to put up two lines, the line showing the number of Facebook ads that the Russians purchased around the US election and the Instagram posts that these accounts managed. The reason I chose these two lines is that on the whole, Facebook ads are not particularly part of the, uh, are not the most important part of a misinformation campaign. Uh, purchasing ads doesn't have the biggest impact. It's actually the organic content. It's the stuff generated by troll farms, by individual managers who manage 20, 30 different legends and put out different kinds of political misinformation. And I chose Instagram to illustrate the important point that much of the traffic, misinformation traffic, seems to have moved off Facebook and onto Instagram. This is a problem because researchers have even less access to Instagram and have less understanding of visual misinformation than we have of what goes on on Facebook. Thematically, uh, the content we saw captures many of, the, many of the polarizing issues that still plague the US. Um, and Black Lives Matter was as important then as a movement as it is now. The Russians particularly pushed content targeting African-American history, uh, important figures in African-American history. There was content around issues that really only play out as relevant in the US, uh, gun control, abortion. And much more recently, there's content related to the Mexican-American community, Latinos, um, trying to advocate for uh, special 
special programs to discourage voter turnout um, and to encourage people to think that um, white politicians won't represent minorities, and so maybe minorities shouldn't vote at all. This kind of mes messaging, we don't quite know what kind of impact it has uh, on average voters, but we know that it's part of the toolkit for um, misinformation campaigns run during elections. Now, after we did the work on the US 2016 election, we, did, we started doing an annual inventory of what kinds of mechanisms are spreading across countries. In 2017, we found similar kinds of operations in 28 countries. Um, these are lobbyists, they're political parties, they're not just military units that have been retasked for information operations. Um, in 2018, we counted 48 countries. In 2019, there were 70 countries in our inventory. So this, this is across authoritarian and democratic contexts. Uh, now there are 70 countries with, a, with organized misinformation campaigns. And keep in mind, these aren't lone wolf activists. These are formal organizations with um, office space and employment agreements, running job ads and secretaries and telephones. These are, these are formal organizations that manage different kinds of information operations for different kinds of actors. Another recent change has been that more and more activities coming from state-backed media organizations. In particular, the last few months around COVID, we've seen misinformation from clearly coming from the Chinese media organizations and from uh, the Russian-backed agencies. At this point, uh, India, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, all have government agencies generating social media content uh, to push political issues, to push an agenda, uh, to help influence how voters uh, and their own citizens think about public life. Another thing that's changed over the years is that the, the services in an information operation have gone from being something that military units and um, the spooks would do to being something that PR agencies offer as part of a package of communication strategies. And one of the tricky things for us studying elections is trying to figure out how it is that political figures manage to maintain contracting relationships, often relationships with firms that break local electoral rules. So these days, this is now, these kinds of tricks are now a sort of regularized offering in the communications industry um, and part of the regular toolkit for a lot of political communication consultants. Over the last few months, um, the, our team at Oxford has just started generating a weekly memo about COVID misinformation. Um, this is a, an unfortunate domain, an unfortunate issue in which the myths around COVID are deadly, right? People misunderstanding uh, what the possible cures are, what the sources are of, of the disease or what to do about it. Um, and of course there are prominent political figures like President Trump who generate misinformation uh, about the cures and the causes and the consequences. Some of those stories get picked up by state-backed media organizations or junk health news sites. One of the things we found is that over time, most of the professional news outlets reach a larger theoretical pool of social media users. They'll reach billions of social media users. But the stories from state-backed agencies and junk news operations get much more engagement. They're much more likely to be shared, to be spread, and we haven't seen much of a change in that trend. For the most part, professional news organizations generate good content, um, but it's the misinformation that social media users engage with the most. I think over time, if we look ahead, there's some existential threats to democracy. I think it's safe to say that every national security crisis, every budget bill, every tax issue will come with some kind of automated campaign, troll-based campaign, pushing it, advocating for it, um, and some campaign against it. Every domestic crisis, every complex humanitarian disaster will come attributing blame to an ethnic group, uh, assigning blame to a group that had nothing to do with the issue. I think we'll see more and more activity from China. They've recently emerged, I think, since the Hong Kong protests as an, an active participant in misinformation campaigns. And I think we'll see other regimes spend more and more resources, staff and money, um, to put their issues out uh, over social media. I think we'll see more and more lobbyists applying misinformation uh, in their own to advance their own domestic agenda whenever they want something passed through government, passed by legislature. 
I don't believe we've seen artificial intelligence heavily involved in misinformation so far, um, but that's on the horizon. If a lobbyist can figure out how to generate a face that you'll respond well to, uh, how to adjust the voice and the tone and the messaging, the rhetoric and the messaging, using your credit card data, using behavioral data from your smart TV, they'll, they'll play around with those tools until they get it right. So I think the toolkit is only gonna get more and more sophisticated. And the deepest threat here is really a threat to science. Um, I think the existential threat here is that most campaigns try to undermine the public's confidence in professional media, in expertise. Uh, most misinformation campaigns try to get us to go with politicians who vote with their gut on issues and um, ask the tough questions, but don't actually listen to evidence. Um, and the very idea that we have evidence-based policymaking as a term is an aim, right? All policymaking should be evidence-based, but it's not clear that all politicians believe in evidence the same way. So in a sense, we're stuck uh, with the form and structure of the social media we have but I do think there are some things we can do to get us unstuck. And then uh, we'll, I'll join, rejoin Vidya and we'll start our conversation about maybe questions for the future and, and ways of getting us unstuck. One of the reasons I'm excited about doing this stuff is that this is actually a moment in which the social science research is key to solving the public problem, the public challenges of um, misinformation. Universities provide a neutral platform. Uh, studying the internet, studying digital media with uh, rigorous social science is going to be part of the solution. It helps us identify the bad actors, it helps us catch the lies, and it helps us work with platforms to get them to stop promoting misinformation uh, once we catch them out. Now, I've got a bunch of ideas in the book for policy things that we could do. I'll start with the first one and then, um, then close up. This is actually an idea that I borrowed from the Blood Diamonds campaign. Um, as many of you may know, this was an innovative, innovative campaign that brought consumers information about where a particular diamond came from. And the rationale for doing this was that if you could tell a consumer um, that the ring they were going to buy, the diamond they were going to buy, came from the nastiest pits of Africa uh, run extracted by slaves, most consumers would not purchase those diamonds. I think we should be able to look at any device in our household, on our person, and have it tell us who is benefiting from the data it's collecting. Being able to trace that background is very important to understanding which political actors are taking your data and making inferences about what you want. We should be able to look at our phones, our smartphones, our televisions, um, our smart refrigerators and get a list of the ultimate beneficiaries, the organizations that are taking the data, using it, playing with it, making money from it. The next step in this is sort of a logical follow on. I think we should be able to add, to add organizations to that list. If I want to contribute my data to my favorite political party, if I want to give my health data to COVID researchers, I should be able to make that contribution. Right now, the best data on public life, on public problems, is not in libraries, it's not with public agencies, it's in Silicon Valley. So the, the challenge here is to rework the flow of data so that our civil society groups, our faith-based charities, our public agencies, our medical researchers, so, so that they can have access to the excellent data that right now is monopolized amongst a very few, very few companies. I put this up just as a way of ending because it's, um, it can be a real downer to talk about this research. Uh, and um, once in a while we study movements. I remember at one point we decided to study the flat earth movement uh, on social media to try to give ourselves uh, something lighter to work on. It turns out that the structure of the flat earth movement is very similar to that of the anti-vax movement or uh, fake troll campaigns launched from Russia. Um, and I think in some ways the solutions are, are similar. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his correct answer over yours, um, so he gets the points. Uh, this is a declaration of faith. I do still believe it's worth pursuing truths. I do still believe it's worth generating the research to catch out the bad actors. And I do still believe that we'll be able to take, take pivot, most of our governments, back to being more democratic, to being able to process public conversations in sane ways, 
and uh, I think it's going to take a few years, but it's a journey I think it's worth doing. So that's sort of the arc of the book, uh, of the Lie Machines book. I'm looking forward to your questions. I see several in the Q&A already, um, but let me invite Vidya to come back and um, start a conversation about what's next for us as a team or, or um, us as a couple of researchers. Where should we start? Thank you so much for, for that fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to ask you a few more questions about, uh, about your book and discuss some of the main themes. Uh, so first of all, it's an intriguing title, Lie Machines. So would you be able to um, explain the origin of the term and also what it means in the context of our research? That is a good question, and I don't think you'll like the answer. Um, the original title was going to be Truth Machines, because I wanted to write about how, how um, politicians and state actors generate misinformation. We fact check it, catch them, and the social media platforms do something uh, right to stop the stories from spreading, uh, and that we restore some sense of truth. I think over time, I'm feeling a little more cynical um, than that, and that the important part of the structure is the part that involves teams of people who produce lies, the algorithms that deliver them to us, and then the news organizations that take them and run them, run with them and do combinations and permutations and keep the storyline going. Um, maybe the next book, uh, maybe we could do the next book together and call it Truth Machines, um, I want to get there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure we have that. We don't. We're not there yet. Yeah, but but yes, to hoping. Yeah, and, to hoping. Um, yeah. and and uh, another question. So, uh, is there a common theme that connects lie machines with your uh, previous books? How has your thinking evolved on the topic of uh, misinformation and political participation mm -hmm. online? Well, um, I think most of my books are, have been about how important it is to connect social systems, to tell a story that connects social systems with technical systems. And I'm, uh, there aren't many um, traditional political scientists or social scientists who will give a technical system agency, who would say that a problem starts with your mobile phone or starts with a social media account. Um, but I think we need to start recognizing that information infrastructure have a causal role in contemporary politics. Now, we can call it conjoined causal combinations, or we can come up with some complex way, uh, terms for that causal role. But uh, for the most part, all of my books are about how politics and technology these days are fully blended. Now, um, I remember once Clay Shirky asked me if... Um, I was wrong because my first books are almost all hopeful and about the prospects for democracy, right? Um, and new political conversations. And this book is not about those things. Uh, I said I was, I said I was partly wrong um, in response to Clay, and I think that's because I still believe that most democracy advocates are more creative and more desperate than most dictators. So dictators definitely learn. They often have significant resources, their own millions or billions of um, cash. They all have their own resources of state. But um, democratic struggles are, off, are awfully persistent. They have their own creative resources. And um, there's pretty consistent blooms of activism, Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, um, protesters in Hong Kong, that blooms of activism are also sustained by technology. Mm -hmm. information technology. And I wouldn't want to do anything that that uh, kneecaps those kinds of creative social movements. All right, great. So do you think uh, internet politics has completely replaced uh, street politics? I think you refer to this briefly in your book as well. Um, so what role has uh, uh, the internet and social media platforms played in mobilization, for instance? I'd say that in every country, in, the, in every modern political setting, there's a technology story. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, it's mostly about journalists and political elites who argue over social media and deliver their content. In some authoritarian regimes, 
it's not it's not citizens um, who use social media, but the diaspora. Um, it, there's, there's some kind of political technology story in every country. Uh, it's not always pivotal in political change, but I would say that most of the major political changes over the last few years, including, I would say, some surprises or um, mistakes, uh, such as the election of Trump or the Brexit outcome, um, those are shaped and structured and constrained and contained by the social media that we live our political lives on now. Um, moreover, I'd say young people these days develop their political identities online mm -hmm. or social media. And most of the time, most of us are not using Instagram to talk politics, right? Um, but in the few days before we vote, um, more people do. And uh, increasingly, political actors try to push content out over TikTok, WhatsApp. I mean, there's a, every platform gets politicized in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, it's, that is actually a very tough question to answer. Um, but I do think, I don't, I don't think you can tell a story about modern politics without making room for the, the technology side of things. Absolutely. I think that's a key point. Uh, but of course, there is the, the argument that propaganda has existed since the time of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. So how are today's lie machines different from uh, previous propaganda campaigns? Well, I'm going to answer that, and then I'd invite you to answer, because I know you have your own answer on this. I think the difference, the obvious difference, is uh, it's so much faster. Most of that propaganda, most of the propaganda prior to 2015 was generated by governments during, during major crises, and it involved broadcast media um, distributed during a big wars, major conflicts, major crises. Now it's agile, daily. Um, distributed in uh, individuated ways, uh, tested, A-B tested, right, very mm -hmm. rapidly with ad combinations, and it's visual. And this is where I think your work is particularly interesting. Um, it's uh, so adaptive that it's, it's possible to imagine these systems whereby uh, complex data that we don't even know we've left behind gets used to create content that's then served up to us. That's, that stuff is new. No, I would completely agree. As you say, we've done quite a bit of research on uh, visual disinformation and also advanced uh, technologies, including uh, uh, techniques to create images and memes. And uh, we do believe that that's going to be the next phase of, uh, or the next uh, version two of light machines. So uh, yes, indeed. And uh, it's also possible with uh, the algorithms that, uh, that exist today to, to uh, target specific groups of people, which is also something that you address in your book and um, also political redlining. So perhaps you could say a few words about uh, micro-targeting as well as redlining. Well, um, the idea of redlining is, um, you know, it's deeply connected to race and um, discrimination and redlining in the US context used to involve figuring out uh, which neighborhoods in a city you wanted African-American uh, households to concentrate in. It was sort of a, a later, a later mo modern version of segregation uh, to create African-American neighborhoods and create white neighborhoods. Um, I think in the technological sense, it's become about helping politicians figure out which neighborhoods, which kinds of people they don't need to spend any time with. So whereas before we wanted our politicians to, to deliver the same speech, or roughly the same speech in every part of the country, uh, to present their ideas, the same kinds of ideas to the whole country and get, get elected on the basis of, of some consistent messaging. Now, if you, if you know that your speech is not going to go over very well in Los Angeles, you just don't go. If you know it's only going to go very well in a particular neighborhood, uh, you go there consistently. Um, or you find your own network of supporters that is, that is distributed and you keep them engaged. So redlining, unfortunately, is still a political tool and it's um, still used often on the basis of uh, race. Yeah, I think that has particular resonance in the light of uh, current events. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's possible to do that more effectively uh, with our access to data and, um, and uh, again, algorithms. So that is, I think, a disturbing aspect of uh, political propaganda. 
Uh, if uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about uh, the distribution of this content and the role that uh, troll armies and bots play in the dissemin dissemination of, uh, 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 you know, disinformation and uh, uh, content. Well, um, w one of our colleagues, uh, you know, has spent time with uh, the, the firms in Poland and another in Brazil that employ a few dozen people who each maintain uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of fake social media accounts. In an interesting way, I think in the last, last couple of months, we've learned that there's actually a different style to misinformation that comes from China versus misinformation that comes from Russia. Mm -hmm. Misinformation that's organized from Russia seems to be, it seems to involve fake users who have a um, long social media history and they put out content about flowers and soap operas and football scores and then suddenly they start talking about politics, but, but they've got a long, long history. The Chinese model of doing misinformation, since, it, since they're relatively new, is simply to purchase 10,000 fake accounts. Mm -hmm. set them up with n numbers instead of names and immediately start tweeting with no, with no history. Um, it's almost like a, a difference between the, 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 the long qualitative craft of misinformation that the Russians may have been good at for a long, long time and the modern uh, just purchase it and, and get it done fast that um, the, the Chinese, Chinese strategy seems to be. Mm -hmm. No, I think we have learned in our research that uh, uh, culture and political um, context is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. to the production and distribution of uh, junk news. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have talked a little bit about, uh, yes, about the production, about distribution, but, uh, but would it be fair to say that we're still missing a few links to, um, to, to talk about the impact and influence of, uh, of uh, disinformation and uh, lie machines on public political discourse? Yeah, this is a great, great question. I, it's probably the next big research. So in, in one way, it's the most, in one way, it's the most important next big research question. In, in another way, it's unanswerable. Mm -hmm. um, I think we don't, we don't have statistical models for how a tweet can change the probability of a vote. We, we don't mm -hmm. have those, those kinds of models. But at this point, we have um, multiple examples of national politics gone off the rails. We've got multiple examples of um, particularly female politicians, prominent women journalists, um, feminist thinkers driven out of public life um, because of trolling behavior. And we've got multiple examples of surprise campaigns organized by foreign actors to try to um, shift debate. Mm -hmm. And then we've got multiple politicians in democracies who themselves are generating misinformation and participating in that sort of project. So I don't think we'll ever have those statistical behavioral models just yet. Um, but, you know, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Um, yeah. We've got plenty of other examples. Yeah. I, in the video, I just noticed there's a great question in, in the um, Q&A right. about, about civil society organizations. And you and I have done quite a few different kinds of projects to try and increase the capacity of civic organizations mm -hmm. to respond. Uh, I think that's um, a very yeah. important, yeah, that's a very important challenge for us. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we can move on to, to the audience questions because I see that there are quite a number of them. So would you like to take that question? So. Sure. I think um, fairly on, early on in our project, we, uh, I mean, we have the same normative agenda. We uh, d developed a spinoff that would engage with civic groups uh, we teach them a little bit about ways to respond in crisis, moments of crisis. Uh, there have been a number of issue areas, particularly around uh, race and social inequality, where the good work of a big civil society group just evaporated uh, mm -hmm. very quickly because the white supremacists in a country uh, used a campaign to, to destroy, you know, uh, to really poison public conversation. So I think that work is, long, is, is sort of a long-term project. And um, in a sense, we were talking earlier about how modern politics has to involve analyzing and has to involve a technology story. I think the mo a modern civil society group needs a data scientist. It, it needs somebody who can track how these campaigns evolve and use even off-the-shelf analytical tools 
to figure out where, you know, where some conversation on Twitter is going and, and how best to respond. There aren't easy answers. There's no boilerplate solution to how to respond if extremists um, start working on your policy agenda. Um, but um, sharing good habits is probably the, the, probably the way forward. Yeah. That's probably the best, um, best way to promote truths. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, within the team, uh, we've, we've organized workshops in a number of uh, capitals around the world and also have a wonderful online resource that civil society organizations can use to combat disinformation uh, right. in their organizations. Um, so That's a good next... point. It's, called, it's called the navigator. I just want to promote that thing, right? So if, if, yeah. uh, if anybody wants to Google OII navigator, there's a whole series of resources for civil society groups uh, on our uh, misinformation navigator that mm -hmm. um, will be useful tools. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great, and, and I see a question from one, one of our, um, one of our uh, future students, yeah? Um, going forward, do you think there's a potential for lie machines to be used to influence foreign policy? Um, I think that's um, a fabulous question, and unfortunately the answer is yes. Yes, in the sense that it's, it's already happening. Um, a couple of years, years ago, the, the team did a study of how misinformation about national security issues was being targeted at NATO military personnel stationed overseas. So these are military personnel on duty um, getting social media content about how the leaders of democracies were um, corrupt, giving the wrong signals, making poor decisions. So we've, we've seen a few of those, a few of those examples um, already. I think COVID has become something like that right now with the Chinese um, interest in promoting in making sure that we don't refer to it as the Wuhan virus and promoting questions about whether the virus um, came out of Africa or came out of um, a lab in the US. I think there's several examples in um, North, North Africa, Middle East, of countries using misinformation as part of um, you know, foreign, foreign, a foreign, foreign policy agenda. Uh, so unfortunately, yes, uh, these mechanisms are, those mechanisms tend to involve military units that have been retasked to do social media, or in some parts of Africa, they involve uh, the huge political parties getting their youth wing to, to do things uh, to attack other political parties and other youth wings. So the, method, method, the mechanisms differ from country to country, but yes, they're there. Thank you, Phil. And I think there's another great question. Uh, so in what direction would you like to see uh, research develop to, to break lying machines? Break them. Well, I, um, I'd invite you to answer that, that too, because in a sense, you, your, your own personal research agenda here is really exciting. I think there's a visual story. Um, and I'll let you say, say something about that if, you, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, at the moment, there's sort of a, a, a preference. There's a tendency for a lot of us in the major universities to study the US and to work in English. Um, there aren't many research groups in the US working in other languages. They tend to, they, they tend to focus on the US. Um, we've been trying to work in uh, Hindi, Punjabi, Arabic, working in other languages and getting researchers to do field work in other parts of the world is, is one of the things we're, we're trying to do more of. Um, in fact, in the next week or so, we're going to release a study of Chinese and Russian misinformation in foreign languages. Uh, down the road, we'd like to be able to tackle Arabic. Studying um, the rest of the world can often be tough. We have tried to run studies in uh, Rwanda, Philippines, Ukraine, where the researchers, once, researcher, once a researcher faces a certain level of risks, we pull them out. Uh, so there's, there's some, uh, there, there are challenges to doing this kind of work. Figuring out how to study the countries that haven't been studied and help the civic groups that haven't been helped yet, that's, that's also a research agenda, right? Yeah, and just to add to that, we're also looking at different platforms because uh, these platforms, uh, you know, they vary in popularity in different political cultures and countries. So we have looked at WhatsApp, for instance, in Brazil and India, um, and, uh, and also, uh, Phil mentioned, visual disinformation. So we've seen a shift in disinformation trends from using 
dubious news sources to relying on memes and videos and images to spread propaganda. So mm. it's a harder task to analyze some of these uh, visual uh, content that we see on increasingly see on um, on social media platforms, and we also yeah. have uh, yeah. Uh, Can I say one more thing? Did you, yes. you remind me? The you know the challenge has also become um, now that we've caught fake news. news there's also fake fact checking sites, right? Uh, and and four years ago, when we started working in this domain, five years ago, most of what we were studying was bots, mm -hmm. fake accounts that were just um, tweeting tens of thousands of times a day and were clearly not human. Um, what, what counts as a bot has really changed, right? Now there's still highly automated accounts, but they're curated by humans with a little more attention. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to use use algorithms to catch a bot. Too many what we call uh, false, false positives. Um, and there's some ways in which, you know, the action is no longer really on Twitter. It's, uh, as Vidya said, it's on WhatsApp, it's on TikTok, it's definitely on Instagram. It's in platforms that don't share data at all. Uh, and so figuring out how to study those platforms, if, if that's where the action is, is, is a big challenge. I think over time, Twitter has become better at uh, sharing data. They're much more likely to uh, package up a group of fake accounts they found in some national context and put it online. Facebook has tried to share data more. I would say they're uh, engaging and responsive uh, at the policy level. Um, their efforts to actually share data uh, aren't comprehensive yet. And so we don't, we don't quite know. And, and their efforts to share data don't include the other platforms, content that's on the other platform, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, the other platforms that they own. So there's a, there's a limit to what um, Facebook appears willing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, yes, there's a lot more work to be done um, and new platforms emerging all the time. That um, We haven't even talked, we haven't, we've talked about Twin Tinder, the Tinder story made it into the book, but uh, we haven't worked on Snapchat really. There's a, um, there's a bunch of platforms we, uh, yeah. including video gaming platforms that we just don't work on. Yeah. A lot of work to do, no doubt. Uh, and I can see a very interesting question about how we could best engage the beneficiaries of some of these techniques and the idea of protecting democracy. Example, Trump administration and the pro-Brexit camp. That one's, that one's tough because um, most of the beneficiaries, I would say, are political, political campaign managers or politicians who want to keep their jobs. And one of the routes, one of the ways to stop misinformation from spreading in democracies is to give the existing electoral commissions, right? Every democracy has an electoral commission of some kind. This is the organization that runs the vote, tries to keep things clean. But in most democracies, those electoral commissions are not as fully funded as they should be. Uh, they don't actually have the power to find very much, or they have a very narrow constraint um, and very narrow policy focus that they're supposed to be working on. So actually equipping elections officials to do their job, um, to be able to follow the money uh, and track social media, that, that's something we should do in democracies. And one of the reasons we're stuck is that politicians won't vote for higher fines on politicians. Uh, you know, they might one day, or some political parties might say that, uh, say that and get us there eventually. But I don't believe um, there won't be many legislatures around the world where we can expect politicians to raise fines on badly behaving pol politicians. Thank you, Phil. So there's another question that do you think that fake news and conspiracy theories grow as the groups offer a ready-made community for people who may need to belong to something? And do you feel that the lies they believe come from a need for comfort in a system they don't trust, or a feeling that they are smarter than those who believe what is widely considered the truth? So that's a great question yeah, too. Absolutely, very, a very nuanced question too, thank you. Um, I think the, uh, yes, in, you know, in COVID times when we have to be, uh, when we're asked to stay at home, we have to wear a mask in public and change our habits and uh, can't get close to the people we miss, we used to work with and we call friends. Um, there's, uh, we, we want to find these truths, we want to find the causes, 
we want to understand the system and we want to figure out when it'll be over. Uh, so I think we, um, it's part of our the searching for truth and trying to understand what's going on is, is going to be an innate feature. Uh, if we're given a screen and the ability to search today, that's one of the things we'll, we'll search into. There's a small section of the book about cognitive biases. And one of the challenges, one of the systems, one of the parts of this lie machine is actually our own brains, right? We're, we're, we're wired to um, want information that confirms a decision that we've already made in the past, right? We, we don't like information that challenges us, that makes us think maybe we made a mistake. Um, we like information that comes from friends and family, and we're a little more suspicious of information that comes from sources we don't, uh, we haven't vetted or haven't seen before. So there's this set of um, selective exposure. Um, there's another elective affinity. We, we tend to choose to stick with groups uh, that we know and like we see ourselves in. Um, and unfortunately, social media are designed to take advantage of those things and, um, of course, profit, generate revenue, um, monetize those behaviors. So, yeah, it's, um, there's, there's definitely a structure that um, wants us to get some emotional relief, some cognitive, um, some, uh, we have cognitive affinities, we want to see resolution, and, and yes, we, we tend to be drawn to emotional and personal stories. So if junk news comes with uh, lots of exclamation marks and all capital letters and dirty words in the title, you know, and an outrageous picture, will be will be drawn will be drawn to that content. Yeah. I think they do take advantage of our weaknesses as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of great questions about uh, social media platforms. So one is about the usefulness of Twitter's fact checking initiatives such as labeling Trump's tweets with warnings. And there's another one um, about misinformation getting more en engagement on social media platforms. Uh, but of course, the social media platforms, their business model heavily relies on public engagement. So how, how committed are they to crack down on misinformation and actors who are perpetuating this behavior? Well, I'm, I, I'm a fan of, I think Twitter has been, the, on the whole, Twitter has been, has moved the most, right? Most of the social media firms uh, responded grudgingly and reluctantly um, over the course of, you know, from 2016 forward. COVID, I think, has made them, made them hustle and be more uh, aggressive with especially stories that um, will um, affect the, the death rate, the illness rate around COVID. So I think, um, you know, I approve. I wish Twitter had done that perhaps a little bit earlier. Uh, for a long time, their policy, their, the way they articulated it, um, they would enforce community norms and take to flag misinformation, except for prominent political figures who, by virtue of their prominence uh, and their place in public life, uh, would not get any kind of um, censure or, or um, markings or flags. Uh, I'm sort of glad that's changed because the, uh, one of the most important sources of misinformation, unfortunately, uh, seems to be the White House and it affects the rest of the world. Uh, right, great. And uh, would you have any uh, 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 ideas about, um, uh, or, or rather, evidence to trace back these uh, trolls to Russia? Because um, uh, you've used the term Russian trolls, but uh, the profile location changes. So, um, so how would you, do you have any evidence to trace it back to Russia? Yes, yes. Um, so some of the account I made made the joke earlier, sort of a joke earlier, that some of the accounts that we tracked in the early years were were mostly in English, and then the highly automated accounts they would switch into Cyrillic and then switch back to English. Um, so that gives some of them away. Uh, the work we did with the the Senate was uh, and Facebook was with three and a half thousand accounts that they said were set up and managed from Saint Petersburg. Uh, so, so they confirmed those origins. And that data actually included um, YouTube channels um, and comments, Facebook accounts, Instagram accounts, Facebook ad buys, Twitter accounts, and um, some Google user IDs that had been clearly started, managed from St. Petersburg and generated um, um, content related to uh, Russian interests. So, so that was another body of evidence. 
Um, we've each different members of the team have done different kinds of field work. Some of my field work uh, was in was in Russia itself in Moscow uh, several years ago, and several other teams have. Um, there's actually multiple teams now that have worked on the forensic side of tracing an account through to um, Russian control. So I think the instinct of the question is right. This should not always be about kicking um, kicking the Russian government for for this kind of activity. Uh, the activities have moved, right? Uh, Iran does it now, uh, Egypt does it now, uh, Pakistan, India, there's now multiple governments that have done it. Um, Russia probably gets credit for being the most innovative. And unfortunately, Ukraine was uh, the country where much of the experimentation happened until uh, the targets, the target moved to the US and, and Western countries. So. Yeah, there are a couple of great questions again on platforms. So. Mm. Twitter, Facebook as highways of fake news and how should we regulate them? And another one about uh, the dangers of uh, uh, moving, migrating to Chinese platforms with even less accountability than, than say Twitter or Facebook. Less accountability. So, yeah. um, so let me, uh, I'll do my best with the first one. The first one is also challenging, right? I think the, there's two buckets of policies that often governments consider. There's the bucket that involves um, censorship and surveillance and, and having a government agency track the content on a social media platform or forcing a social media platform to, uh, to, to censor the content that's popping up on its accounts. And I don't think we want Facebook to become a censor for political content. Uh, and I, many of us wouldn't want government agencies or judges to, to actively uh, track content. The, the second bucket of policy ideas is, is about markets. So trying to use market incentives to nudge firms to maybe direct some revenue back into traditional professional journalism um, or to raise fines or taxes for the, um, the most egregious examples of hate speech uh, or propaganda that, that get through on platforms. I think both, both kinds of policy ideas have their, their advantages and disadvantages. I would lean towards the market ones for, most, for democracies. I'd much rather see ways of making these firms accountable um, with, with open market nudges than dabble in the censorship and, and content controls. Um, I think that's, that's the dangerous path, right, that authoritarian regimes easily take. Thanks, Phil. So I think we're nearing the end of our time. Uh, possibly there is, um, we can take one last question before we wrap up. Um, so how do you suggest to control those who collect opinions and preferences in a deliberately, deliberately democratic, dem democratic way versus those who want to use it for uh, manipulation or manipulate events? Well, I think, you know, the balance, I'd go back to what I said earlier, that I think on the most part, democracy advocates tend to be more aggressive, more creative, more inspiring with their work. So I, I wouldn't want to do anything to a social media platform that stifles that, um, that kind of civic, that civic engagement. The answer isn't going to be to take social media away. We can't do that. In a strange way, the answer is probably more social media with more directed engagement and honest engagement. That's, that's probably what modern politics needs to, it's probably where modern politics needs to go. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for that uh, wonderful conversation. Um, with that, I think we can draw the session to a close and uh, I'll hand that back to Isabel. Thank you so much. And thank you all for participating and for the wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you.